much do you really need to research to write historical fiction? Author Elizabeth Letts tells us about her experiences in the second part of her interview. Hi, it's Angie with HEC Books, where we go to published authors for writing advice. Make sure you subscribe to our channel to stay updated. Now, here is Elizabeth Letts on the research that went into writing Finding Dorothy. Well, obviously when you read a book that is a historical fiction, you always go, what if this is, you know, where, uh -huh. where's the, where are the facts? Yes. And you do a great job at the end of the book. And I don't want to spoil too much, but let's just suffice it to say that the evolution of a lot of those characters, uh -huh. that's real. That's, that, yes. that's based on facts. Yes. So I did a tremendous amount of research and I've written some other books that are not fiction. Mm -hmm. And my last two books were both history, nonfiction. So I come to writing with a background of really digging into the facts and doing a lot of research. So everything, you don't need to make up things about the bombs because they had a very extraordinary life. Frank was kind of, you know, he was a happy, handsome, imaginative person, just the person you would hope he would be, mm -hmm. totally impractical, <laughs> you know? And so they moved and he kept trying. He was a jack of all trades and master of none. He kept trying different careers and none of them really panned out for him. He loved the arts. He loved to sing and he loved to do, uh, he was in plays, he was a drama and, and all of that kind of thing. That was what, what his passion was. When I was doing the research, I decided to stick with the facts of their life where they went and what they did and the things that happened, that's all based on fact. Where did your research take you? Did you go to Aberdeen? I did. I went to Aberdeen, South Dakota. And the reason that Aberdeen is important is that in the late 1880s, Frank and Maude uh, moved to Aberdeen. At that time, it was Dakota Territory. Uh, Frank, as I said, very impractical. And he was it was also, I should say, though, it was, a, it was a time when it was difficult for people to find a way to make a living. It was a time when the world was really rapidly industrializing. People were moving into cities and into factories. And so if you wanted to be a small businessman or something like that, it was kind of really hard to find your place. Right. Um, so I had a lot of sympathy with that. But Frank decides he's going to move out to Aberdeen. Lots of opportunities. And it's a, it's a farming town. It's a very new farming town. So little town on the prairie, not very much around it, and just farmers around it. And so does he decide to, to sell, you know, overalls or like pitchforks? No. <laughs> he decides that what this tiny little town needs is an emporium. <laughs> and he calls it Bomb's Bazaar. Right, And obviously. he fills it to the rafters with things like silver tongs and Japanese lanterns, and particularly more than a hundred kinds of toys. So um, perhaps it wasn't the smartest business decision, but it was just a very Frank-like thing to do. That just kind of illustrates the, the character that he uh -huh. was. Just yes. this. And that's also 100% true. So I went to Aberdeen, yeah. and in Aberdeen, I was able to see the two houses that they, they lived in two different houses while they lived there. They're both still standing. In the library, one of the bomb descendants, um, it was Maud's, uh, I believe, cousin, donated all her papers at the end of her life to the public library. And so the lovely librarian, she just ushered me into a room and started bringing me these boxes. Wow. And I opened them up and it was like family photo albums, pictures of the family. And one of the things that really touched me so much, it was this little handkerchief that had been hand um, laced, made, you know, tatted by Maud. I talk about Maud taking up sewing or helping to support her family through sewing in the book. And so just to see a real artifact like that, it really meant a lot to me. You also got to read her sister's journal, right? Yes. Julia's journal. Yes. That I found in another place. So Maud's sister, Julia, had a very difficult life. And I think that when you really look and you're trying to find the inspirations for Kansas, I, I'm sure that a lot of it is found there. Maud and Frank lived in a town, mm -hmm. um, but her sister really went out and lived on a homestead. And it was quite remote in now what's now North Dakota, uh, you know, just the four walls and the windows and the weather and the wolves outside, really difficult life. Um, there were other factors that also made her life really hard, which you read about in the book. She kept a diary, a very, very detailed diary. Um, and it was, I found it in the North Dakota Historical Society, where you could really read about the daily facts of her life. 
it was her life and kind of the situations with her daughter that really <laughs> it brought you to tears when reading it because oh, it was yeah. so tough. Very tough. But I really think that if you read that, that you can find the seeds of the, of the story and of Dorothy herself. Wanting to escape. And it, right? that's, yes, yes. And that's really where um, the fiction comes in. So there are so many facts that are known. There are so many things, and I'm not going to go make things up if it's already known. Right. But then there's these places where there's, there's, you know, when you go back to those primary source documents as a researcher, as me, and you, in your reading, and then you get to this point, and then they say only so much. So there was, for example, in this diary, there was this one night, and there was this line, and all it said, this is a woman who documented everything in great detail, what she ate and everything. All it said, what a terrible night. And, you Just know. gives you chills, doesn't it? Uh, yes. And in her handwriting, and I'm going, no, no, more, 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 what, what? And you don't know. And that's the thing with history. It's like the documents take you to, to one place. But when there's, when you feel like there's got to be more, you're allowed to kind of as a fiction writer, you can push that door open. And if you've done a good job creating those characters and making them really round and full-blooded and learning about what their lives were really like, then, then I think that you can make it believable. And it's the reader who decides, you know? The reader, if it, you'll know if it feels like it's right. When you were writing this, what is it like for you? I mean, at any point did you think, oh, this is such a beloved story. The Wizard uh -huh. of Oz is such a beloved story. Uh -huh. Then to go to the man who wrote it did you ever have any, you know, apprehension of, of that? And then I think everything? if I had been clever, I would have thought, Wizard of Oz, no. <laughs> Everyone knows this story. What are you talking you know, Judy Garland, you're gonna put her in your book? I don't know why that never occurred to me. I was just <laughs> I I really you know, I think that that you might be able to agree with me with this. Somehow, like, there's something about the relationship we have with that movie and those characters that feels so personal right. that it wasn't until I got out and started talking about the story that I found out it wasn't just me. It was all of us. Um, and so I didn't really worry. I, I don't, I wasn't thinking about my audience or other people saying, oh no, I don't think you got that right. But I certainly was thinking a lot about them. Mm -hmm. And when you immerse yourselves in people's lives like that, it's, it's very uncanny. They become very real to you. You know, they really, they, they seem to walk and talk. And sometimes when you're writing that these things will come to you and you don't really know where they came from. And, um, I felt that so dramatically with this story. And I think, you know, there's there's something that Frank Baum himself um, said where he believed that Oz was a real place. He did not think that Oz was um, fantasy, you know. And so he, he loved children because children had these wonderful imaginations. And when he would say Oz is a real place, they'd say, of course. And he thought when we, when you got older, if you couldn't see Oz, it was just because you had this, you know, veil over your eyes. And if you could just push that veil aside, you could see a plain as day. So I thought about that a lot. You know, I thought, I thought Frank doesn't mind. You know, he, I'm trying to push aside that veil and I'm trying to see them and I'm trying to see them as they were. And, and it was very vivid to me. As I was reading this, I thought, oh, I wonder what his family think about this book that you've written. Mm -hmm. And you actually had the occasion of meeting Frank and Maude's great, great granddaughter? Yes. I was in Ohio. I'm on a book tour right now. Yeah. And uh, she was standing in the signing line and she said, I'm, you know, I'm, I want this book for my father. And then she says, I'm, I'm Frank and Maude's great, great, great granddaughter. And then she opens a folder and in it, there's a picture of Kenneth Baum. So that's one of Frank and Maude's four children, oh, yes. the youngest. And um, she had a picture of him. And then she had a picture of Maude standing in front of Ozcott, which was what the, they called their house in Hollywood. A beautiful picture that, of course, I'd never seen. I mean, I almost started bawling right in front of her. And she was as nice as could possibly be. And she was excited because she said, you know, I know I don't really, it's distant enough now from her. Mm -hmm. She said she knows a few stories that she'd heard from her dad and that kind of thing, but she really didn't know she's dying to learn the family story. So I thought that was really neat. Thanks again for joining us today, and don't forget to like this video and subscribe for new content.